Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. My name is Seth Crossman here with Ben Brayshawn, Dan Mickle. And how are you gentlemen doing today? It's going to be a doozy, Seth. It's going to be a doozy. What do you think, Dan? I agree completely. This is a, this is a good show. It, it's something that I think we do every year, but it, it's, it's really important. And it's a good reminder for everybody out there. I could tell I was excited because my voice cracked in the intro. I was like, what? Where did, what? Well, I like how Dan said we do this every year. So then, therefore, don't listen to the show. Go back to last year's and listen to it. It's probably better. Sure. <laughs> if you want to do planning for last year, I would totally do that. <laughs> that makes yeah. perfect sense. Hey, you guys, we have a show here to do and i um, going to try to keep us moving into that. If you're, oh, if you are new to Money on Tap, first of all, just welcome. Thank you for being here with us. We're all financial planners with Brayshaw Financial Group. Uh, by the end of the show, I guarantee you one thing, you will know how to get a hold of us, Okay with either a phone number or an email. But besides that, if uh, you're just here because you love the topic and you uh, you want to contribute and you want to help us out, we appreciate you going to our podcast, Money on Tap, subscribing and leaving us uh, you know a couple of stars or whatever the review is there. If you can leave us a review, that, that really helps us out in the podcast world. And we want to thank the people that have done that for us. And we want to thank you if that's you and uh, you're – we're going to do that for us. We want to send you some money on tap gear. It's fun for us to do that and just connect with you. So there's that. And with that, it's a, it's a good place for us to kind of do a little bit of intro for you. We're going to be talking about, you know, planning for 2023, wrapping this year up and uh, what you can do for 2024 to get more. Okay. Uh, you heard it here first, folks, uh, more in 24. Uh, and so that's what we're going to stick with and going forward. And with that, it's going to be one of those shows where it's going to be some of the same, probably some of the same stuff that we talked about last year. And you probably didn't do it. So <laughs> or if you did, you're grateful and you need to hear it again. That's the power of what we're talking about here is taking action in your personal finances. And uh, some of the benefits that you can expect from that are, well, potentially some tax savings. That might be nice. Or, you know, getting ahead of the curve and, and starting to move into some of those, um, you know, New Year's resolutions before the new year. So you you don't have to. You know, be so cliche about going into the new year and resolutions. You can be like, ah, oh, man, I've been totally knocking it out of the park. A month ago, I started going to the gym. And who are all these losers showing up here on January 1st? <laughs> I was here before you. Yes, we know we love to be those people, too. And that's probably why uh, we do a little bit of this work. And uh, we love to share it with you. So that's what uh, that's what we're doing here today. So welcome. We're glad you're here. Seth, I think all well said. I really, you know, one of the things about us and our firm is the idea that, you know, we really focus on tax incentive planning. People ask me all the time, what do you do? And I was like, well, I'm a financial planner. And, you know, we go through the process. And I'm going to say, but honestly, I just do tax incentive planning. We focus on all the intricacies around working through how you can make your investments and your life more financially sound by just really just addressing some of the core principles around taxes. Now we're not CPAs and we don't we don't pretend to be. We have people who do that work and and so forth, but we work in this area ultimately to try to really help people amplify the value that they have because it's all about the money you get to keep. People talk about returns and this that and the other thing, but the truth is, is you don't actually know when they're talking to you, does that mean that's how much money I get to keep? And honestly, one of the best ways to really realize immediate money is by saving it in taxes. And there's just a thousand different ways it could be relevant for you. And we're going to cover some of them today that are kind of like broad strokes. But if you are, you're saying to yourself, and you're sitting there listening today saying, I really pay way too much in taxes. We should be the next person you call. I have zero question about that. Like if you pay, think you pay way too much in taxes, give us a buzz. 
challenge us. See if we can help you. Because ultimately, when we get down to the bottom of that, that's what leads into the right investments and the right plan. And that's how it all comes about is taxes, taxes, taxes. And if you're not prepping for 24, there's not going to be a lot more for you. Ooh, that's good. Are you going to one up that, Dan? You got something? I, I don't think I can beat it. But, you know, just the, the same kind of reminder to everybody, listen, taxes are out there. Be prepared for them. Understand what's coming and, and plan accordingly. And we can definitely help you do that. If you walk into it blind, they're going to rob you blind. So that's that's the word of wisdom for you. All right. We're going to do this here. And uh, again, thanks for joining us. With that, it's time for Money in the News. First up from John Fritzy at USA Today. Speaking of taxes, this couple is fighting $15,000 in taxes. Their case could cost Washington trillions. And this article is about a case that I've been following a little bit kind of casually, but it's in front of the Supreme Court now relative to a couple who had invested in a, a business in India and received a dividend from this business in the amount of $14,729 that at the discretion of the company, it appears, was, was reinvested right back into the company's interworkings. Uh, but it you know, spun off a foreign tax form to this couple that the IRS wanted to assess income tax against, that $14,000 number. And the couple's perspective is that, well, you know, that wasn't really income and it wasn't money realized, so we shouldn't have to pay it. Now, this seems like a relatively small amount to get out in front of the Supreme Court, but the ramifications for some of the definitions that are you know, potentially about to be defined here and how it relates back to the tax code is absolutely a huge thing for, for every taxpayer and for our government in itself in terms of how they raise money. So it's a small amount, but a, a really big story here. This is an age-old problem in the tax code. And I think it's coming out in you know, kind of this foreign event that appears to be, and it, it doesn't really go into the detail, Dan that, and Seth, that I, you know, we, we chatted a little bit before the show, but the detail is just not there in the article of whether or not you know, this, guy is, this guy who's fighting this IRS claim of like, hey, I've got $15,000. It sounds like it might be coming through on what we call a K-3, maybe with foreign income. He didn't receive the money, but it went back into the company, but he's being declared that he got this income. And he's saying, well, I actually didn't receive it. And he's fighting this, and there's obviously some sort of control event going on because ultimately he claims – there's a claim that he might be even on the board of directors. And there's a couple of question marks in here. But this has been going on in all sorts of different types of investments throughout the world for us. Like I mean, mutual funds is probably the most common one where you know people – you know mutual fund companies are buying and selling stocks, and you're receiving short- and long-term capital gains. You know Some is taxable as income. Some is taxable as long-term cap gains. And the truth is, is you never did anything. You just invested your money in the mutual fund and you get a tax form every year. And, and you're trying to f- evaluate sometimes, you know, is that a really a taxable event? But the truth is, is, you know, there's times where, you know, people have paid taxes on mutual funds. And, and meanwhile, the mutual funds lost money. It happened in 2008. It happened in 2009. People were like, where did this income come? I mean, I'm, I'm paying taxes on this mutual fund. I just lost you know, 20, 30 percent of my money in this mutual fund. It's been, an, it's been an ongoing problem throughout the the world. I don't think they really are going to have a win here. I, I think, you know, this is a, as it points out in the article, a multi billion dollar problem for the IRS if this gets passed. Now, if it does get passed, there's going to be a lot of people jumping for joy. Now, whether or not this is true income, it sounds like this is different than kind of a dividend reinvestment program. It sounds more like that the, the company declared a profit and then took the profit without, you know, without approval, you know, and just said, hey, we're going to reinvest it. And he probably had a vote on the board of directors to do that. That would be my guess. So I don't think they're really going to have a chance to win, but I, I really do think it's an area where the tax code is a problem. The other thing that I think is interesting here is in the article, it brings up a couple of other big questions, which is the wealth tax. Like by not allowing this to win, like not letting this person win this fight gives the ability, potentially they're saying, a better leg to stand on in a wealth tax scenario where you're getting taxed on something that's just you're wealthy and therefore you're going to pay extra money and you have no income and you have none of this and you have none of that. That could be a painful scenario. And um, there's some reasons why they say, hey, re-election is not going to allow that and so forth. But They've been talking about a wealth tax for years now. Your thoughts, Seth? Oh, I, I think it's um, 
<laughs> it's the tip of the iceberg. And uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, this is a quote from from what he says, is that they could decide the issue narrowly. He says there was realization, you know, and that the company that the Moors invested in, if not the Moors themselves. Um, and the Congress, the Congress and its law to choose to attribute those earnings to the shareholders is where this tie comes up. So if those if there was realization and if they get there, if they get it attributed to them, then, yes, it's a taxable event. If it wasn't attributed, then no. And that's, you know, I mean, in terms of typical equities and, you know, market equities and companies that that are um, declaring dividends and and distributing those those actually are realized and then they go through the tax code and whether or not they're reinvested or not. And so I don't necessarily see how it could go any differently in this event other than paying taxes on dividends. If it's just cut and clear paying taxes on dividends, if there's something else inside of that actualization or realization, I'd love to see it. I'd love to understand it more, but until then um, I'm sorry, I think they're probably going to just wind up paying the taxes and you know what? Solidify what it is and what it means inside of our tax code, and that will probably help everybody else in the down, um, you know, downstream to really be able to work through the rest of it. The wealth transfer and you know taxing, you know, the rest of it, the stuff that's being brought up as far as you know possible wealth tax. I'm. It's a conversation. I'm sure it's hard to stay out of it, but I don't know how it necessarily applies directly to that. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, next up for us, I don't know if any of you listeners are baseball card collectors, and I don't know where everyone stands on alternative investments. We've talked about that. But coming up from us from Fox Business, Kerry Byrne has an article here about Babe Ruth 1914 minor league trading card hits hefty $7.2 million auction, which falls short of hoped grand slam. This card is from Babe Ruth's minor league. It's hard to believe that Babe Ruth played in the minor leagues, right? I mean, Babe right. Ruth minor yeah. league. I mean, I just thought about that. The guy is so talented. It's just, uh, but when he was 19 years old, he played for his hometown Baltimore Orioles when they were a member of the International League. He made his major league baseball debut a year later, or that, sorry, that same year in 1914 season for the Boston Red Sox. We all, we all know about the Bambino. I mean, probably one of the greatest if not the greatest baseball player in history, um, almost undisputable, but I'm sure there's a thousand different podcasts out there debating it every day. This card is literally his minor league card. It, it is a rustic little thing. I mean, as a pitcher and a grand slam, you know, a, a, a home run hitter champion, they thought they were going to get 10 million for this card. Uh, they closed out at 7.2. And I believe this still set the record for the highest baseball card sale in history. I think the reason this article and, and the reason this is so interesting, separate from the fact that, you know, I'm a huge Sox fan. Dan is, too. I don't know what sense. That's what baseball team do you follow? You know, I was actually I'm, I'm glad you asked because originally, I'm not, but I, I know it's not going to be the Sox. So. <laughs> <laughs> originally, originally, I uh, I was an Orioles fan, believe it or not. And uh, that's because when uh, when we did our East Coast tour. Growing up, which you know, we went and, and did the uh, the Freedom Trail and and Washington D.C., New York. Uh, we went to a Baltimore game, and even though I fell asleep in that Baltimore Orioles <laughs> game, which it seemed like it just went on forever as an eight year old, uh, I got a pennant from there and some gear, and I was a fan. Um, but you know, that's 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 a while ago. I've got probably more Boston Red Sox gear than even my. Uh, my Mariners that I love out here in Seattle so dearly, uh, just because uh, you know what we've gone to a Reds we've gone to a World Series together and we've done some fun stuff around the Red Sox and I I sure appreciate them too. So you know that's uh, that's good. I'm, I is, are the Orioles are they a professional team now or not? I mean I, when Babe Ruth was playing for them they were in the minor league so I'm not sure. But anyways, that being said, the conversation around alternative investments I think. We have covered this a couple of different times, but there's just been that growing investment strategy all around alternatives, hence the reason something like this is hitting an all-time high. And I think that, you know, you may not be a baseball card collector, but the amount of collectors that exist in the United States and some of the absolute rarity of opportunity to have investments like this is truly remarkable. And I think 
when you really think about what's going on inside the alternative space, this is a perfect example of how value can be created. I was just thinking about my baseball card collection. Every time I see a baseball card story, Dan, I'm thinking to myself, one of my great grandkids is going to make a ton of money off my baseball card collection if my <laughs> son doesn't sell it first. Yeah, I tell myself that it's too. A, you know, I, I used to work at a, my first job as a kid after the paper route was working in a baseball card store. So if we're, I spent a couple of years really, really deeply entwined in all this. And uh, this was actually the third highest sold card. It, it's at the end of the article. Oh, third. Uh, there was right. a Mickey Mantle rookie card that sold for $12.6 million, which is the all-time high. And then a Hannes Wagner card that sold for seven point two five. But I remember the stories around the Mickey Mantle card from my days working in the shop in the late 80s. You know, that card at that time would go for like 50000 So you talk about alternative investments. You know, in those days, I never saw one, anything like that. I mean, it seemed like an astronomical amount to a 12-year-old. But if you think about the appreciation from the 80s till now, it went from you know, that you know, $50,000, $60,000 neighborhood to $12.6 million. You know, that's an investment that paid off for somebody. Yeah, you know, there's also uh, if, you, if you follow this as well, um, that kind of the, the like the NFTs and some of those other uh, alternatives that aren't as well known, they really fluctuate a lot with cash flow out there. When the economy is on a rip, you'll see all sorts of these assets just really start to inflate, and there can be a lot of uh, frothy emotional appeal around it is what it looks like and a lot of selling and a lot of a lot of headlines out there right now in that industry you'll see a lot of those things that that used to be capturing headlines and be selling for quite a bit have come down substantially so it's a very risky asset it's something for everybody out there that's even interested in it to just go in with both eyes wide open and uh and understand you know not everybody's got this uh this card in specific out there that they're they're looking for with that we've got this is going to be our final article today is one third of americans are skipping christmas thanks to inflation and uh thank you john doolin for highlighting this we debated do we even talk about this it's such a such a downer to hear people would be actually skipping christmas and and uh one of the things that came up is there was a there's a dear friend of our families that uh, actually this year just not going to participate in that part of our family gathering for them, it was kind of this decision that they felt like they were really missing the whole element of what Christmas was about, you know, that that it, it was consuming them to really have to engage in the gift giving and the rest of it. And and as well as it was a it was a financial burden for them. We definitely assured them that it's not important to us, their their gift giving as much as we, we love that part of it. It's their presence is the present and that's what's most important. And I think it's interesting to see, well, for one, how many of these people do not have children <laughs> that are skipping Christmas? <laughs> and and for the rest of uh, the people that are making different decisions around Christmas, how are we doing that to try to alleviate some of the pressure that has happened in our uh, finances from inflation, predominantly from inflation? Uh, and one of the reflections we can see in this is that the article highlights as well is how much debt the average American is covering right now. Yeah, the article really points to a lot to how people are modifying their spending this year. And a lot of people set out to start buying earlier to try and spread the expense over longer periods of time. They said uh, one in five people have added a new credit card this year you know, to make all of their purchases on credit and, and hopefully address them in, in the following year. Which is concerning when you look at you know some further statistics that are here in the article and that we've covered before, where you know there's a, there's a large portion of people who are still spending down last year's Christmas expenses on, that they put on credit cards. So it seems to be this kind of spiral of debt where people are just you know just just doing more than they can responsibly afford to do in the season, you know, in order to participate at the level that that they feel obligated to or they think is customary, but. I think more to your point, Seth, that you know the holiday is not just about that. You know, rather than to strap yourself into years-long debt, you know, find a way to partake and celebrate and be with loved ones without without having to take that financial bite. Yeah, it's it's this is a sad kind of story, but it's a reality of what's going on. And I think my hats off to the people who have made these you know very difficult decisions and honestly brought probably back a much healthier conversation around Christmas. I mean, what is Christmas? It's family. It's friends. It's it's being thankful. It's, you know, it's all of those things. And honestly, the gift side of this thing, you know, creates so much distraction that I think, honestly, probably this one third of the country will probably be happier than the other two thirds who didn't get what they wanted. 
So, I mean, with the amount of lack of money you have, he's like, well, I really wanted this and I didn't get it. Now I'm upset. It's better the person saying, I'm not getting anything, so don't worry about it. It it might be a different glasses half empty story here. You guys, there's there's some information out there for people that are looking for solutions. For one, just give us a call. We've got lots of uh, lots of interactions with our own. You know, my personal experience I shared with our friend that's that's uh, making a different decision this year. But for families that are larger, you know, um, some uh, families have kind of done the, you know, uh, kind of a what do you call it, where you have one person secret Santa kind of a, of a solution where if they're only buying a gift for one of the siblings or one other family member. That can take a tremendous burden off of the finances and everybody still gets to get engaged in the, the act of giving, which I think is. Certainly, I hope, is more important than the act of receiving, depending on what your age is. Um, I'm not going <laughs> to tell you that the five-year-old isn't going to quite get it at that level. But, you know, our seven-year-old and 11-year-old are, are – and, you know, hopefully our 19-year-old will get there one of these days. Is really, really <laughs> engaged more in the, the giving part of this as well. All right. That's going to do it for Money in the News. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or – info at yourmoneyontap.com and we're going to take a quick break we'll be right back thank you for subscribing to money on tap podcast please drop us a line and uh if you do that and give us an opportunity to just to give back to you again we love giving to you in this process and we thank you for giving that back to us we'll be right back with our year-end planning show Are you looking for professional guidance to kickstart your investing journey? Look no further. Brayshaw Financial Group and our planners are here to help. Our team of experts will provide personalized advice tailored to your financial goals. Visit BrayshawFinancial.com today to schedule your free consultation. Brayshaw Financial, investing made easy. We appreciate you listening to Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. You can contact us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's program. Welcome back. You are listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are getting into our year-end financial planning tips, tricks, tax planning. It's a lot baked into this show. Um, you know, we, what do we even call the show at the end of the 2023 year where we're trying to get you to get all of it put together, the things that maybe you've just forgotten about or been on the back burner as well as let's look forward to that 2024 and make sure that we're getting things really lined up. It's going to be the best way to wrap up and the way, best way to set up show for you as we bring this year to an end. You know, there's been a lot that we have packed inside of this year in Money on Tap. We have given you 401k shows. We've given you tax strategy shows. We've get, you name it, we brought it to you. And, uh, and with that, hold on to your seat because, you know, we're, one of the challenges we have is getting through the information that we've got in front of us because guess what? We start talking story and we start having fun with this and we, <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the setbacks that we, one of the challenges we have is don't have too much fun with the financial planning stuff, guys. Okay. Because we really do have to get to some information here for you. With that, let's go. We're going to be talking about maximizing your retirement contributions. Dan. Yeah. I think it's really important as we approach year end that it kind of, as you take an assessment on, on, you know, how the year has gone for you financially, you know, after the holiday spending, I mean, coming on the heels of that last Money in the News article about the state of holiday finances. But, uh, you know, if you're not affected by inflation in those kind of ways and you have some excess money in those the checking account, make sure you take a look at, you know, what your IRA contributions have been if you're not in the employer setting. It doesn't have to come right out of payroll, right? So if you have the opportunity to make a contribution to get right up to the line of the limits, whether it's your IRA, traditional IRA, your Roth IRA, your SEP, your simple, whatever investment vehicle you're using for retirement planning, you know, if you have that opportunity to take a step further and get a little bit more in before year end, you know, absolutely take that chance. Uh, you know, make sure that you're aware of what those limits are and if there's kind of ancillary accounts, things we've talked about, we've done shows on this year, Seth, like the FSA. Make sure that you're aware of where you are relative to the contributions you've made and what those limits are for the year. Because if you have an opportunity to sneak a little in extra here, 
you should really take advantage of that because that's it's just value that's going to compound for you over time. Given the time when you're going to need it in retirement, every little bit is absolutely going to count. Yeah, you know, I think this is the one thing. I mean, we we li- we literally talk about it's all about just committing to retirement. You know, whether it's it's some sort of form of it one way or another, like you don't have to be maxing out your retirement. And I'm sure most of our listeners are not maxing out to the, the nth degree every penny that they can do in any retirement plan that they're choosing to do. But what I always tell people is just nudge the dial forward. You know, if you're doing $25 a, a week or a month or whatever it is, go to 30. If you're doing 100, go to 110. You know, whatever the story is for you, just keep pushing the dial forward a little bit because it will allow you to really learn to live off of what you're making. You know, and if you're running into massive amounts of debt, well, then that's a, that's a phone call conversation with us to figure out if, if you're just you're saving in a retirement plan. I mean, there's, there's that whole story, right, guys, where people put money away in their retirement plan, then they take it out to pay their credit card. And the truth is, is they're just paying you know, penalties and fees and it, for no reason. I mean, at some point in time, it's not a savings account. But if you're able to save for retirement and you're able to manage your expenses, just try to nudge it forward. If you're doing... If you're doing ten dollars a week, you know, try to do eleven. You know, I mean, whatever it is, just keep pushing yourself forward. Get to the point where you're used to it. I've had I had one client who told me one time that when they got their first job, they just maxed out their retirement right on their first paycheck, and they never did anything different, and they never knew the difference because they never made the money, and they always lived within that that conversation. So, you know, if you're a young listener and you're just getting getting started, do that. Max it out immediately. Just just. Grab the bull by the horns, as they say, and you know, make retirement happen. It's, it's a real opportunity. But then on top of it, figure out which retirement plan you should be doing. Look at the tax code. Go back to some of our shows. Listen to you know, whether or not you should be contributing to like a traditional 401k or the Roth side. Figure out if that makes sense for you one way or another. And if you have questions on that, send us an email. We'll respond. You know, I just realized that uh, I've never had a conversation with somebody that says, I wish I would have saved less when I was younger. You know? <laughs> That just doesn't happen. So whatever your age is now, I love I love how you put that, Ben. Just go ahead and make that, like, grab the bull by the horns. What is it that you need to make a commitment to? Go ahead and, and try to get more, do more. You know, what can you do? And then uh, adjust from there. Inside of this, what are you what are you contributing to right now? What have you committed uh, to in 2023? Do you have some gaps that you can start to fill in inside of the 401k? Do you have some conversions that you would like to make inside of that 401k? Um, what are some of the other strategies that you you have available to you inside of your retirement contributions or that planning? Um, maybe you do have some substantial savings on the sideline and you just haven't figured out which direction to go with that because you know you, you've been putting it away in the savings account and the savings account has been earning you you know five percent or whatever but now you've accumulated to a point where it's like well you know what i think i'm a little top heavy in this part of my plan or i really don't even have a plan so this is a good time to go ahead and grab that and start to have that conversation and start to look forward into that next year what is that going to look like for you you know with that we've got the hsa which is one of those um, parts of people's planning that kind of gets left aside and it's a, such a huge opportunity for people we call it a triple threat why because if you contribute to it you're not going to pay taxes on those dollars you contribute you can grow it just like a roth or an ira inside of investments and you're not going to pay taxes on the growth and if you take a distribution from it as long as it's a qualified distribution for you know health purposes and that can be you know uh robitussin tylenol whatever i mean as little as as incidentals like that those qualify because they're under the health uh umbrella or doctor's visits or out of pockets or all, all sorts of things qualify for that. Anyways, the point is that those distributions, right, are, again, not taxed. And so even if you're just using it initially as, say, a, a, maybe a younger couple that, that um, you know, does have some health needs and is using a high deductible plan and can contribute to that HSA, you can use it as a path, pass through where at least you're not going to be paying taxes on that portion of your income. Yeah, you know, one thing to think about, you know, as I was speaking before about having a little excess money in, in the checking account at year end, you know, there's, there's one school of thought would be to, you know, tuck that immediately into a, some type of a retirement or investment account for the days ahead, kind of looking far down the road. But another opportunity there for you know, people who are particularly savvy or would consider this type of thing is, you know, use that money to pay the taxes that will ultimately be due on a Roth conversion. 
right? Take an opportunity if you've, if you've had a kind of a down income year and you're aware of where your tax bracket's likely to fall to kind of amplify that you know, tax-free benefit in retirement rather than just stuffing, say, you had $500 directly into a retirement account. If you come to the conclusion you're in roughly the, the 10% effective tax rate, well, you could spend that $500 to convert $5,000 of your traditional retirement plan into a Roth. And then you have that sum in whatever it grows to between this date and retirement that's going to come back to you tax-free. So if you do have some excess money and are you know, keen on retirement planning, there's a couple of different ways you can approach how to best take advantage of those dollars. I, you know, I really think that if you go back to show after show after show, all we're really offering is the idea that you know, some of these are just reminders for some of you because like, you know, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I, I just can't afford to do what I know I need to do. And there's just, there's that, I should do the HSA, I should do this, I should do that. And, you know, I hope that our listeners are taking this gentle nudge as kind of, hey, this is a priority. You know, like, start figuring out how you can open up an HSA account and just put $10 a month in it if you're eligible for one. Those are those are the conversations that you have to have. And if we don't keep remindering uh, some of our listeners, they just it just goes by the wayside, just like a million other things that each one of the three of us have in our life that we just can't get around the time to. And one day you will. You'll hear it and you'll be like, I just don't want to forget to do that. And, and that's really, really important. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I think for 2024 and to do more and to be more in 24, as we have joked around about a little bit, is really just setting up your financial goals. Like really, like Seth, you were saying, you know, beforehand, in, like don't be the guy in January 1st who decides, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all this stuff. Like do it now. Be ready for January 1 to walk through the door and have it set up. Figure out. So I would challenge our listeners to, you know, see how much money you're spending at, you know, Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or how many times you eat out a week and what that cost is and, and how much do you spend in tips and, and so forth. Figure out where all of your spending is. You know, do you golf, you know, all the time? Is there a membership that, you know, like what, where are you spending your money? And find out, break it down and figure out, like I, I love coffee. I love coffee, love coffee, love coffee. And one year, you know, I literally went through the process of writing down how many times I got coffee out and how much I spent on coffee. Like when we go through the drive through you know, my kids want to whatever blah, blah, blah drink that I can't even say twice, you know, or I have to ask them three times on how to say it. They're expensive. It's ridiculous amounts of money. It's absolutely atrocious. And I went through the whole cost analysis in one year. I told my wife and she literally, I said, well, we're not doing this anymore. You know, now I go to get coffee when I'm not with everybody because it's like a tenth the price. But, you know, when I'm driving around or traveling. But but that has become one of those things as a reminder for me that I have to personally check where is my wasteful spending. And not because it's wasteful, because there's certain things that you just want to do. But where is it that I'm spending money that I find wrong? Where do I find it? Like, that's not the value I want out of those dollars. I'd rather spend it on a vacation or a trip or a weekend away or I'd rather go to dinner with my wife a, a ton more than just spend it on coffee and drive throughs I, I don't know about you guys, but, but stepping into 24, make your money work more. You know, it's not even on our list, but th- that got me thinking about, you know, the kind of the hidden expenditures that if you, if you actually looked, it would be an issue. But just a quick reminder, subscription cleanup. Look at your checking account. See which things are automatically debiting your account every month. And it means there are all these tiny little charges, but they do add up. So take a couple minutes, look at one month's worth of your invoicing in your checking account and clean that up. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We're doing some cleanup here at the end of 2023 with you and doing some uh, tips, tricks, your end financial planning pieces, and we're doing some planning for 2024. So you can get more out of 2024. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Money on Tap. Hey guys, Seth Crossman with Brayshaw Financial Group. Are you ready to take control of your financial future? Look no further than Brayshaw Financial Group. Our team of experienced advisors is dedicated to helping beginners like you build wealth through smart investing strategies. 
Visit BrayshawFinancial.com today and start your journey towards financial independence. Brayshaw Financial Group, your partner in wealth creation. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Ann. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And we are doing some year-end planning with you here at Money on Tap. If you're just jumping into the show, that's what we've got going on. If you've been with us from beginning to end, thank you. And we appreciate you sticking around because we're going to get into some more, more meat and potatoes here with you on what you need to be doing for 2023 and uh, getting yourself set up for a successful 2024. You know, there's uh, a lot that we have to cover inside of just this topic. It's like, what all can we throw at it here, right? We've kind of talked about, you know, checking into your 401ks, what you have left to do there. Maybe there's some conversions that you can take advantage of uh, the HSA account and trying to max, you know, maximize some of these tools that we have to, you know, mitigate some of the taxability of the current year. And with that, we want to try to cover a little bit more inside of that comprehensive tax strategy, right? So what are you doing and what are you what are you aware of that you can even do inside of your current tax situation to try to, you know, minimize some of those taxes if that's your goal, right? Not everybody that I'm going to put it out there for you. The tax strategy doesn't always mean we want to minimize our taxes. Normally, that's what people are trying to do, but sometimes – if you're working with a planner, that's not the case because you might have some financial goals on the on your time horizon that actually require you to report some more taxable kinds of income in order to support some other activities that you have. So that's a fair and balanced approach to that conversation. You realize that this is not everybody's situation. You're an individual and you need to make sure that whatever you're doing is a part of your strategy moving forward. With that all said... Let's explore what can we do to optimize your situation. You know, Seth, I I think you, I just want to jump back because that's literally the most important thing for people to hear is that it's not always about paying less taxes in this particular year that may be the best thing for you for the long haul. I mean, we're at some of the lowest tax brackets in income that we've seen in 100 years. If people don't strategize around when they have high income and low income, I have some very wealthy um, clients who have income years that are astronomically high, and then they have another year that's astronomically low. And we do Roth conversions in these low years because their income's so low, they might as well. Tax rates used to be massively high. Back in World War II, they were at 94% for the highest tax bracket. 94%, listeners, 94%. That meant if you were in the top tax bracket, you only got to keep six pennies of your dollar. That is incredibly high. We're nowhere near that. And so when you look at these kind of oddball scenarios, sometimes paying taxes could absolutely be your friend. Um, so thank you, Seth, for saying that, because I, I think that gets missed a lot. And we keep communicating it over and over again. But that being said, there are comprehensive tax strategies that can help reduce your taxes if you're in a high income earning year. Um, we don't talk a lot about this, but we talk. We do mention tax loss harvesting. You, you may have a stock that you've you've made a bunch of money, and you have another stock that's kind of been a dog, but it, maybe it's recovered a little bit. It's like, yeah, maybe you sell that, take the loss there, take the gain in the other one, and minimize your overall opportunity. And then, you know, a month later, you can look at rebuying that stock. Maybe look for a new positioning piece if you really think that that company you lost money in might be worth as a long-term investment. I can think of another a number of companies that I think are here to stay, but are massively uh, oversold, but they just haven't performed yet, but they, they're profitable. And they're companies that will be around for a while. Their growth feature just doesn't look like it's there yet. And, and that could be the scenario. So you may have a company, you're like, man, I'm holding this thing. And I've been there, folks. I've been there. I have stocks I bought. I'm like, why isn't this thing growing? I've lost money in it. I really think it should go. Just sell it take the loss, push it against some profits, reduce your taxes and, and reset your cost basis and look for another entry point that might work. The other thing is, you know, charitable giving. Probably the massive amount of our listeners are, are just massive givers. I know you all give. I know you love to give. I know your heart's giving. But give in a way that 
benefits you tax wise. For a lot of you, you probably can't, you know, itemize your deductions. And for our older folks who are, you know, distributing out of their or, or in retirement, you can give directly from your IRA. And it doesn't even need to be from, you know, required minimum distributions. You can just give money to charities directly from your IRA to the charity and avoid all the income tax entirely. Which is great because if you can't deduct your charitable contributions because you're already getting the standardized deduction that the government gives you, and if you're married filing jointly, I think it's 27700 or something like that, when you already get that deduction automatically, the only way you get more than that is to give way more or to have enough deductions way over the twenty seven. So the 27000 just already blankets most of everyone's deductions, so therefore they just get that. So if you give directly to the charity – from your IRA, then you don't have to realize that income. And it's the same outcome as if you could itemize. Folks, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, call me. And it, you know, most advisors don't want to do this. Most advisors avoid this. Why? Because it's a lot of work for them. But the truth is, it's about you, not about them. So give them a call. Talk to them or give us a call. You know, We can help you understand what this is all about. But qualified charitable distributions, QCDs, Super important end of the year giving planning um, or giving appreciated stock. You know, you might have a stock that's done really well and you want to give to a charity. And let's say you want to give maybe a charity's doing a big fundraiser for a building or a school or something. And you say, hey, I want to give. And you say, I want to give like 5000 or $10,000. And you have a stock that's made money. Maybe you just donate the shares of that stock so you don't have to pay the capital gains on that. And maybe you made that gain in a short period of time. And if you had realized that gain, it'd be taxed as ordinary income. So you've even saved even more money. So those are things that you should really look at. Giving can be done better and put more money in your pocket and something that people do not give the time of day to and strategize around. Another thing to do is to get prepared for estate planning, right? That's, is it a good opportunity at year end as you're going through all the other kind of financial concerns and, and hopefully you're taking some of our advice from the show and have decided to dedicate a little time to it. Estate planning is something that we speak to often, you know, here on the show, because it just makes all the sense in the world to prepare your affairs to be sure that, you know, whether it's a demise we see coming due to old age or illness or something that's more sudden and abrupt, that the fruits of your labor go to the places you intended it to go. So this can start with something as simple, simple, simple as a beneficiary review. Make sure you take a look at all of your accounts, and that the beneficiaries you've dedicated to those given assets you know, line up with your intentions as you see them today. Those things can always be changed and modified, but it, it's certainly worth the time to, to take a little bit of an opportunity to review those things uh, so that there isn't a mistake made or a decision you'd reversed or felt otherwise about that ends up speaking for you from beyond and, and allocating assets in a manner in which you did not agree to or, or think was appropriate at this point in time. You're speaking about the estate planning piece and then, you know, kind of circling back with, you know, some of the tax strategies. There's kind of an in-between area in this that you can connect both, you know, both areas. And, and some of that has to do with charitable, you know, trust work. Um, we do a lot of charitable trust work here and where you can create opportunities to give to your charities, you know, you know, benefit from the, you know, the tax advantages of that and do some estate planning and or, you know, long-term family planning. And there's a lot of huge opportunities in that space. And, and you don't have to be super wealthy. You might have a buyout from a business. You might have sold a piece of property. You might need some sort of tax opportunity. Uh, a lot of people are you know, real estate laden in this world. And what I mean by that is that you know, they've owned a two-family or a four-family or some sort of investment real estate, and they're tax trapped. They've depreciated the thing all the way down. And, you know, their cost basis is zero. And if you're listening to me, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And maybe it's a half a million, million dollar piece of property. And you're saying to yourself, how do I get out of this? How do I deal with these taxes? There's opportunities around all of this stuff. And they intermingle and intertwine. And there's some really creative planning. But a lot of the people, baby boomers, are saying, I don't want to worry about the hot water heater anymore. I don't want to worry about collecting rent. I just want to go retire and do what I want to do. And there's ways of combining all of these pieces, the tax strategies, the estate planning, and the charitable giving, and this kind of tertiary opportunity to really say, you know what, there's a time for me to get out of some of this stuff and create tax benefits inside all of that. Gosh, I, Kira just, uh, Kira's my, my 
my lovely bride, if you don't know her, she's uh, she's just here with me too. And um, just the other day, she was going through some continuing education for her business, which is commercial real estate. And multifamily is one of those pieces that was getting covered. Amazing piece here that we're talk- covering right now is like maybe it's not about the toilets and the the fact that you just got a lot of stuff going on inside of real estate that you have to care for in order to maintain that asset. Maybe you have some real estate in the Portland market, which has just turned into an on absolute, honestly, God bless you if you have real estate that's not your primary residence inside Portland, then that is um, your scenario. There's so many, so many landowners and real estate holders that are just getting out of the Portland market because it has just turned into a nightmare. And I know that that's not necessarily just the Portland market as well. It's like you have better have a PhD in multifamily in order to get through what you got to go through to rent in that that market. And if you're just like, hey, I'm out, you know what? That's a good spot for you to go ahead and connect as well because there's just options and understanding what the lay of the land is. Working with your brokers on, you know, different parts of the country. How do you move assets from one place to another and having a plan around that? Super significant and really what a blessing to be able to have people that know how to do that well and really um, leverage your abilities. You know, you're listening to Money on Tap. We're talking about year end planning. And you know what? I just completely went sideways on that last piece. So thanks for bearing with me on that. But we're going we're gonna to take a quick break gather ourselves or myself and when we come back we're going to get into more year-end planning financial tips and wizardry here that we've got for you on money on tap don't go anywhere we'll be right back hey everyone dan michelon here with brayshaw financial looking for a hassle-free way to invest look no further than brayshaw financial group With Brayshaw Financial Group, you can start investing with as little as $100, enjoy a user-friendly platform with a diverse range of investment options. Visit Brayshaw Financial Group and start your investment journey today. Brayshaw Financial Group, investing made easy. We appreciate you listening to Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. You can contact us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's program. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are doing some preparation to wrap up 2023. Uh, Hopefully, you took that moment to sharpen your pencil again because we know you've been taking notes and for those of you that have just been kicking back and listening well we've got some steps ahead for you too because uh, we know that you want to engage and it's all about engaging in healthy activity around your finances and taking those steps that you need to be successful in your investing with that gosh have you seen the market lately wow up we go down we go. That reminds me, uh, actually, one of my, my my daughter used to do this funny thing when we would be driving along and she was in the back seat in her car seat and she would go up the hill and down the hill. And that just kind of reminds me of what the investment world has been like lately. What's it going to do? Because it's just, it's, oh my gosh, it's a fun place to go spend time. But the truth is, is, you know what, we want you uh, to be prepared for market volatility and have that baked in to your preparation for 2024. What does that look like for you? Let's find out. Yeah, I think we're, we're heading into an election year. So we know that there there's some historical indicators. I know Ben's going to get to some of those that we've, we've done shows on and spoken to in the past. But uh, the one thing that this climate leads to, you know, whether it's it's the Fed, it's the geopolitical worldwide issues we have, or even more locally, what's, what's happening in domestic politics, is that we are in a topsy-turvy world and, and the market's behaving that way. So take an opportunity to review your investments at year end. You know, this might be a time to rebalance, right? This might be a time to take a look at you know, how your allocations are set up and, and see if you think that that's the right position to be in as we head into 24. Um, you know, maybe it's time to get a little bit more defensive. But the, the opportunities exist to, to change where your money's at and you, you definitely want to take a good, cautious approach to that as we're, we're just in these uncertain times. There's just no way around it. Yeah, you know, the, the market is interesting. A lot of people have questions about, you know, what does an election year look like? And those, those things kind of bounce all over the place. And 
Um, you know, statistically, year three this year it, in you know in a presidential uh, president president's time period, year three is the best performing market year out of you know out of all four. With the fourth year being uh, the second best, then the second year, and then uh, the first. And, and I mean, and it varies. And that's most of the time. And then the last two presidencies, both with Obama and Trump, that has not been the case. Um, matter of fact, with Obama, his first two terms were more profitable than his third. And for Trump, his first year was better than his second. But his um, the major surge he really had was in his third, which was in play. But the fourth year was hit with COVID. So that was really interesting. I mean, that's kind of an interesting conversation about where that was all going. But those are kind of some of the uncommon players in that space. So that being said, I mean, you know, next year statistically should be okay. And I think that's why some of the forecasting is that, you know, we're going to hit 5,000 on the S&P, maybe 5,200 by the end of next year. But I got to be honest with you. This is an election like no other election I think is coming. <laughs> I think I think everyone's wondering who's running really on the Democratic side. I mean, there's been some arguments. I mean, I think I think I had read an article and I don't know how factual this is, but you know, Biden was removed I mean Biden is the only person that's gonna be on the um uh, on the primary ballot in, in one area in Florida. I, I can't it just just cra- there's just so much stuff going on with this election. I just think that this year is gonna be very, very interesting. I think it's gonna be interesting with the Fed. I think it's going to be interesting what inflation really reports at. I think it's going to be interesting about the ele- I just I just think it's it's going to be a year for some uncertainty. Well, uncertainty is certain is is the certainty that there is inside of a market, that's for sure. Uh, and being somebody that uh, loves to engage in the market and is looking for opportunity, there are plenty of opportunities there. I think that's the thing that we keep coming back to is 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 the 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 market continues to give us these opportunities. Whether it's the, you know, the the typical headlines out there that the S and P is surging or the Nasdaq is surging or AI is whatever the headline is, those are interesting things. And at behind the scenes, I think we continue to look for you know companies that are making sense. You know that have. Uh, great cash flow, uh, and also are you know maybe kind of cornering a segment of the market where they're ju- they're just pivotal and they're necessary, and there's no way around it. And those are places that I think historically, if you're a fan of Buffett, right, and and that strategy that will continue to work out throughout no matter what market you're in. And so, being wise with your money, being wise with those dollars that you've earned, and on also being available for opportunities because sooner or later this market's going to give us some significant opportunities whether that's you know a real estate opportunity or just a, a pure market opportunity like we saw in 2020 or in 2008 and 9 those are events that do happen so let's also be wise and prepared for those as well with that this has been a pleasure being here with you today now okay i promised you if you were not, if well, you know what? If you're if you're taking notes as well, we don't want to exclude you. We want to you know include you as well. What what I'm going to put to you is this: you have some things on your plate right now. Either it's just the the stuff that's on the back burner you haven't gotten to, and you need to pull it forward, right? Or it's right there. You're working on it. What I wanted to ask you is this: is to put it in writing. Send us a, a an email at info at yourmoneyontap dot com with the top five things that you are planning on doing and accomplishing with 2024. And you can actually put this into the wrap up your 2023 as well. If you've got some outliers there, that's fine. But we want to get you ready for 2024 and we want to get you activated and committed. And so if I were Dan, I would call it a smack goal, right? You ever heard of that, Dan? <laughs> sure you have. <laughs> it's a smart goal. It's specific. It's measurable. It's achievable. It's relevant. And it's time bound. And it's nothing new. You've heard it before. And you've heard it now on Money on Tap. Get it in the smart goal. Get it over to the wise guys here at Money on Tap. And we're here to help you stay accountable to that. And you tell us how you want us to engage with you, right? All right. We're not, we don't have, we don't have that information. We're not sitting there with you today. We want to be here for you to go ahead 
and make those moves you need to make. And we're here to help you out with that. You tell us how you want us to help you be accountable. If it's, you know, an email next year, that's great. If you want to get on the phone with us and get down to some business and do some planning, fantastic. We love all that. But either way, we don't want you to walk away from today without taking action and becoming successful in your investing. That's what we're all about here at Money on Tap. And that's what we're here to do with you today. So with that, make it a great week. We cannot wait to be here with you this next week. We only have a few more left in 2023, and uh, it's going to be a good one. So you don't want to miss out. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subject subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through SagePoint Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group, LLC, are independent of SagePoint Financial. SagePoint Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551.